into the Cougar Tailgate, where BYU fandom lives. Here's your host, Lauren McClain. What's up, my friends? Lauren McClain here with Cleon Wall, and we're doing what we do best, talking all things BYU Cougars. Here's what's coming up on the show today. The Zags came to Provo for the last time as fellow members of the WCC. Mark Few wants the rivalry to continue. Do we? We'll discuss. Plus, with the waves rolling into town, we'll chat with Pepperdine Graduate Assistant of Communications Brock Reisler about how their athletes strive to compete with purpose. But first, it was a heartbreaking ending to a hard-fought game that came down to the last second. The Cougs fell 75-74 to the top-seeded Bulldogs. Cleon, there were a lot of emotions going on for us BOU fans during this game. What was your takeaway? Uh, I don't want to be Mr. Negative. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really don't be. because there were so many good things last night uh, from yeah. that game. How many threes they hit in that game. The fact that they were down 10 and they were able to come back. Uh, I mean, there were so many positives. But my goodness, the game was right there for the taking. It looked like they would do it. Yeah. And they just they blew it. They blew it. I mean, I think they would say the same thing. They blew it. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just have three little things and it mainly deals with the end of the game. Out of bounds play. Not great. They need better designed out-of-bounds plays. They need better executed out-of-bounds plays. They need better passes from out-of-bounds plays. I mean, with just over a minute to go, BYU was up four. If they complete an out-of-bounds play, they're getting fouled, they're getting fouled again, and they're going to the free throw line. And we'll talk about that in a second. But they're up four. Bad pass turnover leads to a three, and now it's a one-point game. It, all it needed was just one completion on an out of bounds. It was a sideline. It wasn't. An, it wasn't a baseline. It was a sideline, and it was. It was an interesting pass that Jackson Robinson threw, and <laughs> it was a bad pass by Jackson Robinson. But Spencer Johnson couldn't get to it either. It, it was just a weird play. They just need something better there. Uh, secondly, Jackson Robinson missed free throw. Um, that killed them too. If he would have made that free throw, the worst thing that would have happened is Gonzaga makes a three and potentially they go to overtime. Instead, he goes under a screen. That killed Jackson Robinson. Strother hits a three, puts Gonzaga ahead, and then the final play. I- I'll-, I'll say this. I think Gonzaga played that last BYU offensive play well. Uh, they oh, had yeah. three oversized guys on the on the perimeter. They swarmed Spencer Johnson because they knew he was going to take the shot. It's too bad Spencer couldn't have passed it to anyone, but I'm not even sure the angle he could have passed it to anyone because Rudy Williams had gone down to the baseline, then hurry and tried to pop back out again. And by that time, it would have been a desperation three by Rudy Williams too. So I I think they played that well. I I think that could have been a a little bit better play call, but I I, I would even say Gonzaga, Gonzaga really played that well. And, and that's the, you know, as some people say, them's the breaks when it, when it comes to that last offensive play. (laughs) I agree, and very good coaching by Mark Few and the Gonzaga uh, Bulldogs there at the end, putting him in a great position to win that game. Somebody asked on Twitter, actually, Ben Criddle asked at the end of the game whether that was on the players or on the coaches, and I'm honestly not sure. I think ultimately that's on the players. Hopefully there was something a little bit better drawn up that just wasn't executed. This win, Cleon, would have been a season changer for BYU. It would have been huge playing Gonzaga for the last time at home in the WCC. And I think it was still a really exciting game. Like you said, there were so many positives. And I hate to put everything on Jackson Robinson because he he kept BYU in the game in the second half with his three-point shooting. He was phenomenal from the three-point line. There was just a lot of rookie mistakes there at the end. BYU needs to work on the press break and how to handle tight end game situations. They've really struggled with that this season. They struggle with taking care of the ball. A lot during the game, but especially at the end, the Zags had too many second chances out rebounding BYU 47 to 32. Let's talk about Drew Timmy for a second. He is just (laughs) an incredibly special player. Every time he had the ball in his hand, I was like, no. Just when you think he's down, that's all I would say. He he comes back and you're like, oh, yeah, he's that good. Yeah, I forgot about this guy. Oh, wait, you can't because he's incredible. BYU had a great shooting night shot, 52% from the three which has been uh, a lot different from how the rest of the season has gone. So that really helped in their favor. That was great shooting by them. I wanted this win so bad for the team. They're, they're such an eclectic group of guys that have so much talent. They have a lot of flaws, of course, but they have a lot of heart. They're in, they're in every single game. They truly, truly are. And on a positive note, this showed me that BYU has a legitimate chance to make a run in the WCC tournament this year if they can figure out how to take care of the ball and obviously had to take care of the ball at the end of the game, which which they should be better at at this point in the season. But they work really hard. They play hard. I think this game showed that they have what it takes 
to make it far possibly in the tournament, which it would be so exciting in their last year at the WCC. They just need to know how to close out. Cleon, and we got to mention, one thing that does need to be mentioned is how incredible the fans were last night, especially the rock section. They were amazing. It causes problems for teams. Somebody mentioned this on Twitter, and I agree. BYU doesn't always have stellar opponents come to the Marriott Center, so the environment isn't always rocking like it was against Gonzaga. But they are one of the top student sections in the country when good teams come to town. And let's think about it. Next year, BYU will be playing a whole schedule of Zags. Kansas, Kansas State. Oklahoma, Texas, there's just, you can go on and on and on. The Marriott Center was going to be bumping game in and game out. So get your tickets now, my friends. Yeah, even when they don't have the best teams come to town at the Marriott Center, the arena is still the best, or you could even say the second best in the WCC. And I'm not just talking about because of sheer size. I'm talking about the students show up, they're engaged, they want to be there, and they cheer their fans on. The rest of the fans are actually pretty good, too. And it's great when big teams do come to town because the place really is rocking and you do you are able to pack a whole bunch of people in there. And I know the size of the Marriott Center has shrunk because they've gotten better seats, you know, in the past few years, but it's still one of the biggest arenas in college basketball. Uh and, and it's great and it's great when big teams come to town. I was just going to say and last night they actually had to make room for students. Like there there were so many it was a sold out crowd. And I think it was record number. They had to make room in different spots that didn't even exist to fit the students that were coming into this game. So how cool is that? No, no, and I agree with you. If and when they are the second best crowd or place to play, it's just because the Zags Kennel would be the other one. But the Marriott Center (laughs) holds almost three times the amount of fans. I mean, the Kennel only holds like, I think, 6,000 fans. That's pretty small. Mm That, I, yeah. I know I know you go across the WCC, and a lot of people have said, you know, the one great thing we'll like about leaving the WCC is the high school gyms uh, that BYU plays in. But the one thing about the kennel is, even though it's only 6,000 6, fans, it's a raucous crowd. And so oh, yeah. those are the two best places, I think, to watch a college basketball team and uh, a college basketball game in the West Coast Conference. You know, the Marriott Center, it's a fun place to watch a game when big teams come to town. And there'll be a lot of big teams coming to town next year. I just hope the games are close. We're not going to go into that right now. I'm just hoping that some of these games are close and that we we get some really good ones against some really good teams. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to be dwindling as uh, <laughs> as time goes on. Hopefully <laughs> as the season goes on, the, the fandom is going to start going up. Let me just say, I was a student at BYU in 96. I was here from 96 to 98. when I was here when BYU won one game. And you could Ugh. you could walk into the Marriott Center and you could sit anywhere you wanted. That the <laughs> you team, could hear your own echo. Hello. It, exactly. In fact, I had a friend and a friend of mine and I. We would go and we would sit actually in batch, back of the opposing bench. That's how few season ticket holders used to show up too. Wow. And we would uh, we would sit in back of the opposing bench because we we had fun just yelling stuff at them, but nothing really bad. Anyway, it, it's just. <laughs> That's how bad it can be. And then I was here the next year when um, when Steve Cleveland took over and they won nine games. And that wow. some of, I mean, they got better, but even, a lot of those games were even hard to watch. So I've seen the worst at the Marriott Center with you know bad crowds and a bad team. I, I don't think we're going to get there. And if for nothing else, it's going to be fun to have a Kansas come to town. Or, you know, just one of those big teams, a Baylor come to town. You can name any one of the big 12 teams and it's just like, yeah, I want to go see that game. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think even if BYU is struggling, people want to see Kansas in the Marriott Center. Like who's not going to want to show up for that? So I think you're right, especially those first couple of years. I think attendance is going to be incredible no matter how BYU fares. And let's hope it's not too bad. I like what Gonzaga head coach Mark Few said about playing the Mary Center. He said, I don't know how many places out east, the center of the universe, have a place like BYU. There are 20,000 people that roll in there and they're as dedicated to the cause of cheering for the Cougars as any place I've ever been. And we've been fortunate enough to basically play everywhere. Unbelievable home court. Unbelievable effort they play with there. And Gonzaga was actually the highest ranked opponent that BYU has ever beaten in the Marriott Center. And that was in 2020. The Cougars were ranked 23. They beat number two Gonzaga 91 to 97. That would have been a great, great repeat 
but uh, unfortunately, the Cougars came up short. The first time that BYU faced off against Gonzaga was actually not in the WCC. Cleon, if you remember, the first time they met in the NCAA tournament in 2011, a.k.a. Jimmermania. BYU pounded the Bulldogs 89-67, to starring the National Player of the Year, Jimmer for death. I just remember that uh, Sports Illustrated photo of Jimmer uh, shooting <laughs> yep. a jump shot. It made him look like he was Michael Jordan shooting that jump shot because uh, it was a down low shot and it was it was against <laughs> Gonzaga. I believe it was against Gonzaga. Anyway, it was during that run and it I, was. I, I do remember that. That was that was a fun again. Not trying to wax too nostalgic, but that was a fun team and it was it was fun to beat Gonzaga back then. If you look really closely in that photo on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you will see a blonde haired girl right behind the press bench. And that was me. We were right. Well, we were we were sitting right behind the Gonzaga Bulldogs. I was there as a student, uh, covering the team and covering Jimmer. And it was one of those moments that was just unreal. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that run. It was so much fun. They played. We went to Denver. They played Wofford, and then they played Jimmer. I mean, sorry, they played uh, Gonzaga, and then uh, headed to the Sweet Sixteen. So yeah, such a fun run. And ever since that first game, it has mostly been all the Bulldogs. Uh, the Gonzaga leads the series against the Cougars 23 games and to six. BYU has beaten Gonzaga three times at the Marriott Center and three times in Spokane, the other being in the NCAA tournament game. You know what's weird about that is regardless of Gonzaga winning so many more games than BYU, I think this rivalry has been really fun. And I think both schools get up for this game. BYU for obvious reasons that the Bulldogs consistently being a top 10 team. And then the Zags because BYU is one of the only teams in the conference who was a threat year in and year out, who has come into the kennel and beaten the Gonzaga top 10 team. So, Cleon, do you want to see this 12-year rivalry continue even when BYU is no longer a member of the WCC? Yes, 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 yes. Full, <laughs> a full-throated yes for me. I, I know it's not going to happen every year like what we have right now for Utah, and I know that can even go away. But I would like to play Gonzaga. I'd play Gonzaga in a heartbeat, I guess is what I'm trying to say. If it was next season, I'd say, sign me up. I, let, let's do this. Let's find wow. some place to play. Um, you know, Gonzaga started the run to greatness back in the in 1998. Dan Monson was the coach. They made it to the NCAA tournament. They upset a couple people, and then they just kept going back to the NCAA tournament uh, year and year after that. In fact, they haven't missed the NCAA tournament. The only year they missed the NCAA tournament was the year that everyone missed the NCAA tournament. That's in 2020. Yeah. And so, you know, they were plucky underdogs back then, and now they're a basketball powerhouse. I'm sorry, but for me, how can you not love a team like that? I guess because I'm a little bit older and I understand where they came from and what they are now, I, I appreciate Gonzaga for who they are. They're in Spokane, Washington, Lauren. <laughs> I mean, this is, they're not in Los Angeles. They're not in Texas. They're not back east somewhere where you can recruit a bunch of guys. They're in Spokane, Washington. I know they have mm-hmm. beaten BYU a lot, but we're not talking about Duke, North Carolina, UCLA, and none of the blue buds, blue blood schools. And I, and I can't even say they're a team like a Villanova, which is a religious school in a big city, and they can draw good basketball players to that city. I guess that's why I like this team. I've seen the rags to riches of this team, and I like that they're rich. And I'll cheer for Gonzaga once BYU leaves the WCC, and I'd love to see them win an NCAA tournament sometime. I, I'd be okay with that. I'm absolutely with you. I I always cheer for Gonzaga. When they enter the NCAA tournament, it's Gonzaga all the way for me. And I I love, too, that they come from little Spokane, Washington, and they're just this incredible powerhouse. Mark Few, man, you can say so many good things about him as a coach. He's just an incredible, incredible coach. He's done amazing things with that program. So for me, I'm similar to you. I, I don't want them to play yearly, but every once in a while, Absolutely, yes. Preferably in the Final Four, Cleon, of the NCAA tournament, <laughs> but that's a that's a pipe dream, at least for a really long time. BYU is going to have their hands very full in the Big 12. I don't know if the Cougs will want to add more stress to the schedule by adding the Zags, but honestly, when I was thinking about this, I was still football-minded. I was still kind of thinking football, where it's like, whoa, you don't, you can't have a crazy schedule, but but with men's basketball, any or women's basketball, the, the schedule's really long, right? I mean, they, they play many, many games. So you definitely can throw Gonzaga in there. And I think it could be a good beginning of season game to see where the Cougs are at and how they'll they'll fare that season in the Big 12. And like I said, I love Mark Few. I think there's a great relationship between the two schools that I wouldn't hate to see continue on occasion, especially with Mark Few still at the helm. When If if and when he ever leaves, I don't know if that's going to continue. But until then, uh, I, I think definitely they should keep playing each other. For people who say, I don't want to play Gonzaga because you're going to have a a hard enough conference schedule, again, look at the top teams in college basketball 
They play in top conferences and play against tough opponents, but at least once or twice, once or twice a year, maybe even three times a year, they schedule another really good team. Gonzaga is yeah. one of those teams that does that. I mean, they play a tough non-conference schedule. So why wouldn't you want to play a team like Gonzaga? I'm going to say Gonzaga because we have a history with them. But why wouldn't you want to play a team like Gonzaga in the non-conference? Uh, even though they have beaten you a lot, who cares? Let's let's see if you can measure up to who Gonzaga is. Yeah, I think you're right. And Drew Timmy, who we were just talking about, Gonzaga's men's basketball star, who we love to hate, but who's just incredible, said this about the BYU rivalry. I think it's a special rivalry and one that should continue even past them leaving the conference. I think it's something that we should do home and homes forever. I feel like it's developed into such a great rivalry. And then Coach Pope also mentioned that there's a possibility that the games between Gonzaga and BYU continue on, even if it isn't yearly. So that's great news. That's great news, uh, Cleon, for all of us that want this rivalry to continue. Let's talk a little bit uh, about women's basketball for a minute because they are on a five-game winning streak. They beat LMU 63-46. to Lauren Gustin specifically is playing out of her mind, averaging a double-double. She had 24 rebounds for the second straight game, out-rebounded the Lions 24-22, to and she herself out-rebounded San Diego last Saturday 24-23. to LMU only had 11 points in the first half, and Amber Whiting has been preaching defense, and it looks like that traveled with them to keep the Cougars in the game. What do you think of this women's basketball team, Cleon? You know, I've been impressed. Um, they, they don't play a lot of players. they got to play a few more against LMU. I've been impressed how this team has started to turn things around, uh, how they're buying into to, to Coach Whiting. And, and I've just been impressed with uh, – I've been impressed with Lauren Gustin. I mean, she's really stepped up. She is – the leader on the court. No, she's not the person who dribbles the ball up the court and is the one that's distributing the ball. But my goodness, she's the one who's, uh, you know, basically holding the players accountable from what I can see out on the court. And it's it's a little bit through word, but it's a lot through deed. I mean, she is oh, just, yeah. I, I, she's playing the most out of anyone on that team. And she is just amazing. She goes after every single rebound. I don't know how she's... <laughs> I don't know how she's standing up at the end of the day for how many rebounds she, rebounding she gets. So I, I've been so impressed with this team winning five games in a row. Yeah, they're probably they're they're not going to win the West Coast Conference, but it's been so um, heartening, you could say, that they've yes. been able to turn this season around. They were four and eight, and they've won five five in a row, and they're now nine and eight. The opposite of the Cougars' defeat last night. Uh... Not disheartening, heartening. The women's basketball team is heartening. No, I love that a lot. Yeah, they, they've they been an awesome. I love that they're buying in, and I hope it continues. Coming up, BYU men's basketball faces Pepperdine on the court, but we'll talk to Waves graduate assistant of communications, Brock Reisler, about the importance of what their athletes do off the court. This is Cougar Tailgate. Welcome back to Cougar Tailgate. I'm Lauren McLean alongside Cleon Wall. BYU and Pepperdine University are similar, and they are both committed to upholding Christian values and doing everything for a greater purpose. One of the unique ways the Waves implement this goal is through the Competing with Purpose blog. And joining us now to talk more about what it all entails is Pepperdine Graduate Assistant of Communications, Brock Reisler. Thanks for coming on, Brock. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So, Brock, tell us a little bit about the general history of the Competing with Purpose blog. Yeah, the Competing with Purpose blog is a really cool thing that um, our athletic department, and specifically our athletic communication staff, um, puts together um, sort of on a yearly basis. And it varies uh, times of the year that we do it. But uh, the Competing with Purpose blog was started uh, we're not really sure when it started, but it was at least over the last 10 years. It was most likely started by our former um, assistant AD for communications, uh, Roger Horn. And, and it's kind of a way to uh, bridge the gap and just have a, another insight into our student athletes um, for the supporters and alumni and fans that we have a, have of Pepperdine Athletics. So the blog is up on our website um, and uh, we use it to uh, interview student athletes and uh, learn more a little bit about their lives off the field as well as on the field and the things that they're doing in the community uh, with their family and uh, how they represent represent Pepperdine Athletics. Um, and the the cool thing about the blog is that it really, um, it shows our core values. The core values of Pepperdine Athletics are purpose, service, and leadership. And this blog um, hits all three in different ways. So it's been a really cool initiative, uh, one that I've been a part of as well. And uh, 
yeah, it's a really cool thing for our department. It looks like some of the early blog posts focused on recapping what was going on in the sports that were being played and some general general introduction of players. What do you think made the change to focusing more than just on the stats, but actually going in depth with some of these players to get to know them a little bit better? Yeah, I think there's a really cool thing about um, Pepperdine Athletics and kind of quote unquote mid major um, schools in the size of our schooling is that um, athletes aren't just a number here. Um, there are a lot of really cool sports and, uh, some cool people involved in those sports and we don't have football. Um, so a lot of, um, different sports that may get lost in a football school, uh, don't get lost here. And, um, the cool thing that when we went to the shift is, um, it allows us to gain an insight into our student athletes better. I mean, we're really focused on the holistic student athlete experience at Pepperdine. Nobody here is, is just an athlete. And we really get to know the people, um, that make up our teams and make up our athletic department and the shift to learning more about them and what's going on in their personal lives, um, just helps them illustrate and helps us illustrate as a department, as, as a university, um, what the cool, the cool people that we bring in and um, what they're doing to better themselves, um, in the community and as a wave. I love the idea of this because there really are some just incredible stories from some of these athletes out there. What are some of the most inspiring stories that you've either written about or read about within the Competing with Purpose blog? Um, man, that's a good question. There have been a lot of cool stories. Um, one of the cool ones from this year specifically, um, Kaylee Hames, who's a volleyball player for us, um, her sister is a star volleyball player, Nicklin Hames for the University of Nebraska volleyball team. And um, we got to go as a team. I didn't, but our, our Pepperdine volleyball team played at Nebraska for an early season tournament this year. And um, so the two sisters got to play against each other for the first time. And Nebraska did a cool thing where they, I believe they introduced, when they were introducing the team, obviously they um, introduced Kaylee and there was a really cool round of applause. And um, it was a cool pictures. Nebraska tweeted some pictures about how kind of emotional both girls got. And so for Kaylee to talk about that um, in the blog. And I talked to Kaylee like personally after like, how cool an experience was that for you? Um, and then for her to get to um, talk about that in the blog and what a cool special moment that was for her. Um, that was a really cool, uh, that was a really cool experience. And I think our readers really enjoyed that. Is that your favorite blog post that you've written or is there something else out there that you've written in, in the recent past that you just really loved interviewing the player and then writing about it too? Yeah, so I actually didn't write that one, but I've I've written one blog post for the Competing with Purpose. Generally, what happens is our students, um, like student interns, undergraduate students will be the ones to come up with the blog. Like maybe we'll say, hey, we have a really cool story. We'd like you to talk to this person about it. And it really builds um, experience for students to talk to student athletes, whether they want to be in this career as a reporter or whatever they want to do in college athletics. Having that interpersonal skills is really important and really cool with athletes that we allow our students to do. But the blog uh, post that I wrote was probably my second week out here. Um, I talked with Alex Hobbs, who's a Pepperdine women's soccer player. I mean, this was kind of more of like a fun hearted one, but um, she kind of got TikTok famous during um, during the COVID pandemic about uh, I believe it was squirrels in her outside of her outside of her house. And so she kind of blew up on TikTok. And so uh, my boss thought it would be kind of a cool idea to talk to her and what that process was like and how cool it was to kind of be a content creator. So you're a graduate student. You also work in the sports information department. And I think I read on your bio, you're also in charge of running home sporting events on campus. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm i very blessed here. I am in an online master's program, so I'll graduate uh, this spring with my master's in leadership in higher education. Um, I kind of do, I feel like I try to do as much and maximize my experience here as I can. Um, I'm in charge of um, women's tennis, men's tennis, and women's swimming and diving um, as their SID, but I also work every men's volleyball game, men's and women's basketball games, doing stats, soccer games, uh, baseball games, beach essentially anything that's going on on campus, um, I help to work with. And it's given me a really cool um, experience to to uh, experience different sports and learn a little bit about um, each sport and the players and athletes and coaches that make up our, our great department. So you really don't do much is what you're t- I'm just kidding. That was a lot of stuff that you just mentioned. <laughs> so Pepperdine <laughs> is probably, probably not sad that uh, they're not going to be able to come to Utah in the wintertime anymore, but BYU is entering the big 12 coming up. 
What's the general vibe about BYU leaving the WCC there at Pepperdine? I think it's going to be a shift. We're so used to to BYU being in the WCC. We've had a lot of great battles with BYU in a lot of different sports. Um, the thing that sticks out to me from from this year was the the soccer game um, in October. I think it was four three five four or something like that. Just a wild game. And then the the men's basketball game last year, where I think uh, Alex Barcelo had a had a Firestone Fieldhouse record number of threes. I think he had nine threes in that game last February. So it'll be sad to see BYU leave. I'm excited to watch uh, to watch BYU in the Big 12. I think there are a lot of sports that they can come in and and be competitive in right away. Overall, I think it's it's excitement to see where our conference is going to go and what's going to happen in the future. But um, sad to miss the the rivalries, especially in some specific sports that we've had over the years. We need to get to the hard hitting questions now, and that is the fact that you got to go to the national championship football game. But not only did you get to go to the national championship football game in Los Angeles or Inglewood, California, I should say, you went as a mascot. Explain how you did this. I did. So uh, this kind of started back in the fall. Um, We were sitting in a meeting and uh, the the, the vice president of major events for the L.A. Sports Entertainment Commission, Karina Harold, she used to work at Pepperdine. And uh, she reached out to us to see if they had anybody, you know, Pepperdine had anybody who'd be interested in being a mascot for the College Football Playoff Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of the College Football Playoff. And I was actually Willie the Wave for um, Rampage, the L.A. Rams mascot, his birthday party at SoFi Stadium in August. <laughs> so I guess I was qualified because I had uh, a mascot. I had three hours of mascot service prior to this. And I said, sure, I'll do it. Extra way to make money. <laughs> and uh, so I was this whole weekend, this past weekend, I was involved with um, duties downtown, looking at um, just being involved with college football playoff and the extra yard for teachers initiative. And it's cool to me, um, even though I am an Apple, but the extra yard for teachers initiative is very cool and personal to me. Both of my parents are teachers. Uh, my fiance is a teacher and my brother is a teacher. So getting to do something that's really worthwhile um, in the community and make some money and get to experience things like the college football playoff national championship, um, Pepperdine. And, and uh, I'm very grateful for what's happened here and for the experiences that I've gotten to have. Absolutely. What an incredible experience. We're talking to Pepperdine Graduate Assistant of Communications, Brock Reisler. You're a busy, busy guy, so we appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for being here with us, Brock. Thank you very much. And that does it for us today. Thanks again to Brock Reisler for coming on the show with us. You can join the Cougar Tailgate wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or on BYUradio.org. Cougar Tailgate is a production of BYU Radio.